start. So welcome everybody uh, to our online book club of the Association of Jewish Refugees. My name is Deborah Barnes. Um, for anyone not familiar with AJR, um, we are the national charity supporting Britain's Jewish refugees and survivors of Nazi oppression, and we are committed to the education of others about the Holocaust. For more information about what we do, please go to our website. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. As is usual with our online events, we're going to keep everyone on mute, but there will be an opportunity to, um, to ask questions later on. We're going to do this via the chat function. So I will send a message out um, on the chat and you can reply to that. Uh, they will only come to me, the messages and we will ask um, them at the end, or we'll get to as many as possible at the end of the chat. Um, so um, we're recording the session today, yes we are, and it'll be made available on our YouTube channel. So if you don't want to appear, please, um, on the recording, simply turn off your camera. Our guest speaker today is Rosie Whitehouse. Good afternoon, Rosie. Hello. Um, author of uh, her new book is The People on the Beach and Rosie is going to be in conversation with David Herman. So I'm going to pass over to David and Rosie now and um, I hope you enjoy the conversation. Thank you so much, Deborah. I'm David Herman. I'm going to be talking to Rosie for about 35 minutes or so and then we'll uh, pass back to uh, Deborah who will read out questions that you may like to send in to her. And I'm going to be talking to Rosie about her fascinating new book, The People on the Beach, uh, subtitled Journeys to Freedom After the Holocaust, published by Hearst, that's H-U-R-S-T. Rosie is a journalist specialising in Jewish life after the Holocaust, and she writes for BBC Online, The Observer, The Independent, The JC, Tablet Magazine and others, and as, is an historical advisor at the Vienna-based Centropa, a Jewish history institute. Rosie, on a summer's night in 1946, over a thousand Holocaust survivors secretly travelled to an Italian beach. Why? What were they doing there? Well, actually, that's the question that arose in my mind immediately that I stumbled over a newspaper cutting which described this event. And I... I'm a specialist in Liguria. I'm also a travel writer and I was writing a guidebook to Liguria and I thought, what is this strange story which i would never come across before? And our family have connections with Liguria and notably with shipping and ports in Liguria. And when nobody knew about this story, the first thing I did was I went to the beach. Now the beach is a tiny pebbly beach near the port of Vardo, which is a workaday port which uh, where you go to uh, take the ferry to Corsica and there on the beach I met a fisherman who was a young boy and he remembered seeing the Jews arrive and the boat leave but as I left the beach I thought oh I'm going to just buy a book and it's going to give me all of the answers um, and that will be the end of it in fact I ended up having to write the book because that question that you just asked was a monumental question to answer which took me many years of research to put together but in essence, uh, these Jews had come from all kinds of places. They'd come from the forests, they'd come from concentration camps, and they had made their way down over the Alps into Italy, some of them independently, and some of them with the help of the Jewish underground, notably the Jewish Brigade, who were a unit of British soldiers within the British army who had been recruited in Palestine, much in the way that we recruited Sikhs in, and, and Canadians and New Zealand to, and New Zealanders, for example, to fight the war. They were part of the British Empire forces. And they went AWOL at the end of the war, and they went, they decided that they would go against British Army command and drive into Austria and even up into Poland to collect refugees and to bring them to safety in, in Italy. It's an amazing story you tell, and yet it's to many readers, it'll be a sort of brand new story. And I suppose one question is, why, how did this story ever get forgotten in the first place? 
Well, that's something that's exercised my mind, particularly when I was researching it, because my book was a, a leap of faith into the dark because I felt my journalistic nose twitched and I knew I was onto a good story. And, uh, and as I began to research the story, which became more and more dramatic by the moment, I began to sometimes think, was I going insane? Having, was I the only person who realized that this story was in existence? And that is that, that the, I drew comfort from the fact of beginning to understand and to work out why this story had been forgotten. Um, there are a number of factors. Firstly, much about the Holocaust was forgotten in Eastern Europe when it went into the Stalinist deep freeze and it was not discussed. So that is one explanation for why the stories of, of which start my book about partisans uh, and leading the people out of, out of Eastern Europe, they, they just disappeared from history. The other one is that, as I recount in some detail in the book, is that Jewish Holocaust survivors who found themselves in, in the American zone in Germany were treated with the utmost disdain. And the general in chief of the American forces, General Patton, was an out and out anti Semite. And it took some time for the survivors to have their special case recognized. And during that period, the disdain with which they were treated only made them feel that there was no future in Europe. And it's not really, it doesn't really fit into the patriotic picture that uh, of the victorious allies smashing the Nazis to tell this story. So that's another reason it was a little bit embarrassing. And then by the time you cross into Italy, you reach the story of how the Jewish underground helped these survivors. Now, this became a very important story because this was not the only case of the Jewish underground helping Jews in difficult positions. They were going to go on to help them escape from Arab lands. They were going to go on to help Soviet Jewry. And the same people who helped the Holocaust survivors escape, um, leave Italy and go to Palestine illegally were the same people who carried out these operations. And Golda Meir said at one point, this story will be told over her dead body. It's now that we can tell the story because today we have slightly different techniques for bringing uh, Jewish people in, in great difficulties out of countries and we're beginning to pass on to a, a new phase in, in the story. But also there was a reason in Israel that this story was forgotten and it's a little bit unnerving because when the Holocaust survivors arrived in Israel, many of them were also treated with some disdain because we have to remember that Israel was a reaction against the European Jewry, largely a reaction against East European Jewry, that that was the old world, this was the new world. And so if people came as remnants of the old world, they weren't kind of really fitting in with the new world, which is quite shocking, to, was shocking to me to discover. And it's also part of the explanation that when I began to investigate the names of the people who sailed on the boat, I began to discover that there were vast numbers of partisans who sailed on the boat. These were the kind of people that who were going to be the new Israelis. They were people who'd already carried guns. They were tremendous people of agency, not that every single person who sailed on this boat was somebody of agency. Let's just go back to these people on the beach that, that night. Nearly all of them, something like 21 out of over a thousand people are under 40. Why is that? Well, that was the first question was actually, uh, I mean, even to get these figures was incredibly difficult. Um, I had to go to uh, to uh, Atlete, which was a detention camp where they were held to find their names. And then um, I, I found online in a version of a Hebrew newspaper where their names were published, fortunately with the names of their parents. Be uh, I was then able to make a list of these people. I mean, it, it sounds incredibly simple but, but to find out why were these people like this, but it literally took me weeks and weeks of looking. And in the middle of the night, I actually cracked it. And uh, my daughter and I were dancing around the bedroom when we actually discovered their names because that also was still left enormous amounts of problems because many people had changed their names and for some reason many of the Romanians names had been uh, turned into Slavic surnames. I have no, I don't know why this happened. All I suspect is that somebody thought that when you said you're Abramovich, you were actually Abramovich and it just got written in the wrong way because it was a Polish person who was writing it down. I have no idea. But it made it very difficult for me to follow the stories of, of the Romanians. But we can see from the short demographic profile of the people that there, there were 
very few elderly people, virtually nobody under the age of about 10, uh, unless they were babies who had been born after the Holocaust. And of course, the, the elderly and, and young children were the first victims. They also, the majority of the people on the boat were men because the majority of the survivors were men. And also we have to think here, it's also why these people were selected by the Jewish underground to go on an Aliabet ship. You had to be pretty tough to endure this eight day cruising. It wasn't like a cruise liner. You were literally hanging in hammocks and there was about this space above your head before the other person's hammock. There were appalling conditions and the Josiah Wedgwood was a Canadian Corvette and Corvettes are famous for their rolling motion. They normally have about 47 people on them. So we can see this reinforces the horrendous conditions. So really, I don't think it'd been very sensible for the Jewish underground to put you and me on that boat. I think we'd have been in a bad state. So I would probably have said, yes, take my kids first. They're young, even if I had survived. And in, that was often the case that it was the elderly people and the infirm who were left to sit it out in the DP camps until the 1950s. You said a lot of them were men, but the book is full of fascinating and powerful stories about women. Yes, I think that this was something, uh, well, as a woman, I was delighted to discover these stories. I was also delighted to discover how many women were in the resistance. Well, in a way, that wasn't a surprise to me because my own mother-in-law was in the French resistance. And, uh, but these were women who were actually carrying guns. They were actually, they were actually fighting with equal rights alongside the men and they were actually taking more risks so when i'm uh, i went to vilnius and i met one of these former partisan ladies she actually described in great detail how she had she was part of the avakovna group of, of partisans who fought in the rudniki forest and she said that she really didn't have much time for avakovna he had his head in the clouds and basically it was her and all her lady friends who were actually taking the most tremendous risks because uh, they were less easy to identify if they were caught obviously because they weren't circumcised and many of them had blonde hair and they could pass as Lithuanians but these women took tremendous risks and then what by the time you get to the Jewish underground who are helping the people uh, to get on these illegal immigrant ships the second in command of the Jewish underground in, in Italy was a woman called Ada Sereni. Uh, she was a woman in her 40s. She was a widow and a mother of two children. And, um, and she had left her grown children behind in, in, in the Palestine mandate because she actually came to Europe to find out what had happened to her husband, who was Enzo Sereni. And he was, he was murdered in Dachau. And uh, he was a, a, an, a, an underground agent. He was actually in charge of, of the underground agent movement in, in, uh, in occupied Europe. And uh, she is a woman of incredible strength. And she also went on to uh, arrange all of the uh, details for, to support uh, Soviet Jewry when they were leaving, because of course, so many of them went through Rome. She was uh, born in Rome herself, she was an Italian. And we should say, of course, because this is 1946, they're trying to get to Palestine, not the state of Israel, which doesn't yet exist. And so there is a British embargo. And so these ships are sort of secret ships trying to break through the blockade. Absolutely. And actually, this is one another reason that I think this story has been forgotten, because we like to commemorate the pre and post Holocaust stories, which make us feel good as a nation. We like to remember kinder transport. We like to remember that we gave a home to over 700 child Holocaust survivors, some of the youngest child Holocaust survivors who came to the UK. These are very important and positive stories, but these are the ones that are pushed to the forefront. And we don't teach in school this piece of empire history, which is a little bit uncomfortable uh, when we see on one hand, the Home Office here are happy to give a thousand visas to child Holocaust survivors. On the other hand, the Foreign Office is upholding the white paper, which virtually closed the door of Palestine in 1939. And although the Labour Party said on the hustings that they would, they would no longer adhere to the white paper if they if they became became the new government. Once they won power, they did not do that, and they kept this paper in. They kept the limitations of, of Jewish immigration to Palestine in the white paper, and. It also put the British Army, I feel, I think, in a very difficult position, which is also, I think, another reason that we should talk about this a little bit more, because it's about what we actually ask our armed forces to do. 
um, my own father-in-law was uh, was sent to to fight to sent to Palestine as in, 19, in in 1946 because he was Jewish. He was asked if he would like to go somewhere else, to which he said yes. But other soldiers did not have that choice, and they were put in very difficult positions because when the Josiah Wedgwood actually arrives off the coast of Haifa, it's bordered by British Marines. We can't assume that all those Marines were content with the orders that they had, and we know that during this period a lot of British soldiers were helping helping the Jewish underground and as as the Palestine mandate crumbled. And you make some very interesting choices right up front at the beginning of the story, which is essentially you could have told the story of the of the boat and the journey and you know what happens when they arrive. But most of your book is actually about the backstory of who these people are, how they came to be on that beach and then on that boat and then in Palestine. And why, why did you make that choice? Well, I suppose it's because I'm a journalist uh, and I'm a travel journalist. So my natural instinct is to get in my car and go go to the place and start to ask questions. I mean, um, so I think that that makes me, it makes the book different from if it had been written by an academic. Um, and I'm sure that there are downfalls in the book because it hasn't been written by an academic, but you get me instead. So you get me in my car, driving around, talking to people. And I think this is the most important thing that we have to start to think about now, particularly as the Holocaust begins to tip a, tip over into into popular memory and is not held in individual memories um, even if it's holding collective memories within families we will eventually soon have have nobody left who actually who has actually alive in that period I mean both of uh, both my mother-in-law and my father-in-law are dead so our collective memory remains with us and so I think this is very important about how we remember it but it's also really important on the ground in, in Europe today about why we don't remember some aspects of it. As I just mentioned here in the UK, we choose not to remember to the Royal Navy blockade of the Palestine coast. But there are plenty of people I met along the way who were not Jewish, who were very keen that this story was remembered. And they had a political agenda for doing this. And I think that that is very interesting and it's an important lesson about memory. So I wrote a lot in the book about the Poles who are keen to have the story remembered about what happened after the Holocaust, a very difficult story for uh, for Poles to, to, to face down. And again, ha what happened in the DP camps in Germany and then in Italy. In Italy, it's an easier story to remember because the Italians were extremely positive to the Holocaust survivors who arrived. And when you, you, in the book, I describe how when I'm talking to one of those survivors, when I mention the name of the Italian town, which was the first one he arrived in, he jumped up and started shouting, Amore, Civilazione, and, uh, and immediately started speaking in Italian. And that was the reaction that they had to the Italian. So for the Italians, it's a good news story, but it's not a good news story if you sit on the right of Italian politics, because obviously they don't want immigrants in Italy and there's it's almost a reversal now that we've got illegal immigrant ships coming into Italy so it's a very political what we think about refugees and what contribution refugees can make to the country in, in which they end up. And you say that the Italians sort of welcomed these people but of course this was a huge contrast to many of their hometowns back in Poland and East Europe where they were not at all welcome. And I wonder no they were not welcome and but I think that we don't want to go into generalizations here. I mean, I make a, I, I write a large, it's almost like an essay in itself within the book, as I drive around Poland and I talk to people about what actually happened in Poland. And the situation on the ground in Italy and Poland was dramatically different at the end of the Second World War. There had been devastation in, in Italy. People had, the, the, obviously the allied armies have fought up Italy and, and faced, desperate resistance from the Nazis, but we weren't in this total war situation which had been experienced in Poland. And the really key thing that we have to remember is that when the Nazis invaded Poland, that they shot the elite. They shot the elites in the villages, they shot the elites in the towns. The real top elite, 
took off and, and made a government in exile in London or the communist ones went to Moscow. So the country was left rudderless without these elites. These elites also included, you know, they included the teachers, the doctors, the local politicians, which included Jewish people as well as, as non-Jewish, as well as Poles and, and in some cases in, in the East as well as Ukrainians. And these people were all shot. So what was a very underdeveloped society, which was extremely poor, uh, there were the most of the people who lived in the cities were very poor. They worked in, 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 in industry and were paid very little. And then we have a big peasant community who were less rudderless in as this cataclysmic war charged across their country. And if you, they, everybody knew what was going on in Poland. If your, if your neighbors, your Jewish neighbors were taken away, you knew they weren't coming back. So why would you leave their coats hanging in the in the in the wardrobe? I, I can, you know, I, I imagine I would have done the same. I think you would have gone and said, right, well, let's take these blankets. We need them. We're freezing. And so in even in these small levels, it implicated people in what was going on, which meant that they, they didn't really appreciate their neighbors coming back. And it changed, um, it changed relationships on the ground quite considerably. In some places before the war in Poland, there had been really real difficulties with anti-Semitism, with uh, shop boycotts and people throwing stones at, at, at Jewish children. But in other places that had not happened. And the war changed this completely. It changed the situation on the ground, much to the surprise of many of the survivors who did try to go home and uh, were, did not expect to be greeted like that. But the situation in Italy was fundamentally different. And there's a fascinating range of people's backgrounds. As you said earlier, there are people, partisans from the forest, there are people who've survived the ghettos, there are people who've survived the camps. Uh, and in a way, I suppose the boat allows you to sort of focus, find a focus to bring all these people together. Is that right? Yes, it did. And actually, uh, I mean, the first thing that I, I, I worried about when I discovered the story of the boat is how would I discover who the people on the boat were and I started trying to search for a passenger list and my daughter who at that point was working for UNHCR said to me mommy it's an illegal immigrant boat do you think they write down the names and I was like Dum. and I was lucky that they in that sense that they were interned at Atlet otherwise I wouldn't have had any material to work with in order to trace them but it it became to me extraordinary how much they illustrated the experience, um, the experience of the of Jewish Holocaust survivors, and the fact that we have we don't have any French people, and we have one child, um, tells us a lot. The Jews did not leave France in this way. It, this that's another story altogether. So where they actually come from tells you a huge amount, not only about the percentage of the populations that were coming from these places. The majority of people came from Poland, but the majority of Jews lived in Poland. But also, as we've just discussed, the, the it was a very anti-Semitic place after the war, and it was also becoming increasingly uh, sucked into, stuck into the Stalinist world. Um, and so, yes, I think that it, it was extraordinary to find these different people, but the key element of the group that, well, there were a number of key groups in it besides the partisans, were those who came from Kovna, the Lithuanian Jews from Kovna, and they had been deported to Landsberg uh, DP, uh, Landsberg uh, concentration camp, and they ended up in the Landsberg DP camp. And one in particular, uh, a doc, young doctor in his thirties from from Kovna, a radiographer, ended up in the Saint Ottilian Monastery, where he set up a first he cared for Jews in, in he set up a hospital, and he cared for the wounded, and then he turned it into a maternity hospital. And uh, because it was not safe for Jewish babies to be born in ordinary hospitals. And I was very shocked after I visited St. Ottilian when I checked the story out on the Internet and I discovered that uh, a German midwife was put on trial for murdering 96 Jewish babies after the war. It's really shocking. And uh, but I think that the Jews from Kovna brought to this situation in the Bavarian DP camps a sense of continued Jewish resistance in the fact that they did not give up, they did not abandon their Jewish identity. And we see a revival of Jewish identity in the DP camps in Germany, as well as a revival of, of, of Zionism. It's a revival of confidence where these people become agents of their own, their own destiny. And they become determined to 
speak, have Yiddish plays, have write British Yiddish newspapers, have religious services, have non-religious organizations. And you see the myriad of Jewish life, which had existed before the war, being reborn. It's an extraordinary thing that this happened in Germany, but it did. So you have two main, two main tasks to begin with. One is to find the names of these people. And the second thing is to then find the actual people in Israel years, years, years later. How on earth did you do that? Well, it, this book really turned me into a detective. Um, I mean, I suppose all journalists to a certain extent are detectives, but this became extreme. And it did actually become, begin to take over my life. I remember once at midnight, my husband saying to me, do you really have to carry on looking for Yitzhak Kaplan? And I said, yes, I do. I'm sorry, just go to sleep. I've got to find this man. And uh, some, one or two of the people that I met were relatively easy to find because they've been involved in Holocaust education in and involved with Yad Vashem, like Moshe Ha'Elion, the Greek gentleman that I interviewed for the book. But uh, the said Yitzhak Kaplan was evading me and I was very keen to find him because he came from Rivna, where actually the story of the, of the liberation of the Jews begins in February 1944. So he was a very key person for me to discover, to discover why the Jews left Rivna. And I eventually, I don't speak Hebrew, but I began searching um, in Hebrew to see if I could find him. And a gentleman turned up in Haifa with the name of Yitzhak Kaplan, standing next to a, a young girl who was in, in the army. And I then took this picture on, on my phone and I went on Facebook and I crossed looked at this girl until I could find the girl of the same name on Facebook and I wrote to her and she was bingo I, I hit I hit immediately but another case was that I discovered this very interesting group of, of friends over a hundred of them who survived many of them from uh, from Budge from the Lord's ghetto um, who were then taken to Auschwitz who then endured numerous death marches and by tracking the names of the death marches against the names that I had on the list and spending hours and hours and hours watching uh, survivor testimonies. I began to put this group of people together, this story, and then I thought I better start to see if any of these people are alive. And I did, lo and behold, one of them was alive and on March of the Living. And I asked March of the Living if they could give me his address and his telephone number. They would only give me his address. So I went and I wrote him a letter, which I also translated into Hebrew. And I took it, I just put it in a brown envelope and posted it to him. And a few weeks later, his grandson uh, started sending me text messages. And a few weeks later, I was actually in his house. And when I arrived at his house, he was waving the brown envelope, pointing at the picture of the queen on the envelope. And, uh, and uh, for, for both of us, it was an extraordinary experience because I sat down at his kitchen table, very intimate um, situation. We start talking about his life story. He's the one who actually I mentioned earlier, who jumped up shouting in Italian when we, we started talking about Italy. And he was part of a group who were cared for in a children's home in Italy in Fiesole. Now Fiesole is room with a view country. And this children's home they were cared in for was a villa with a view of Florence. Uh, it seemed to have actually eluded most of the people that I spoke to that they were in a place which most of us would dream of, uh, of going to because they had more important things on their mind. But um, it was so interesting because I had identified this friendship group and I had searched on the internet and found photographs of them. And so when I opened up my computer to show it to him, he goes, ah! those are my friends, where did you get their pictures? <laughs> and so, it, I mean, it became a really intimate experience with them. And I, I think I did the right thing because when I was researching the book, I went and found the story first. So when I arrived at these people's kitchen tables um, in, in Israel, that I, I already knew the questions that I wanted to ask them. And I think that that was, that was very important. And and I think that they respected me because I'd actually already been on this journey. And that to me was quite surprising. It was quite surprising because you may have actually, those of you who are listening to me now, I thought, what's this lady, Rosie Whitehouse? What's she doing all this? And that's exactly what the Holocaust asked me, uh, the Holocaust survivors asked me. It's like, uh, Whitehouse, it doesn't seem to be a very Jewish name, is it? And I said, well, no, it isn't. Um, but my married name is Judah. And they go, oh, that's all right then. I don't have to watch what I say to you. And I was really shocked by this because uh, I thought that is unnerving. And then I found as the stories went on that one gentleman in particular who I write about in the book, Menachem Kriegel, he decided after 
numerous conversations we had on the telephone uh, where he'd asked me lots of questions about myself. You know, I justifiably have to explain who I am and why I'm interested in, in them as a story. Uh, he said, I told him, I explained to him that I'd spent a lot of time in Ukraine and, and my husband is a foreign correspondent and he had covered the war in Ukraine. And he said, because you know Ukraine, I'm going to tell you something I don't tell other people. I was hidden by a supporter of Stefan Bandera. And Bandera, of course, was the Ukrainian nationalist leader. And he said, when I say this to other survivors, they don't believe me. And I just thought, oh, it's it's terrible that that the, 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 there's clearly, you know, people are catching their tongues even today in, in 2020 about what they say actually happened to them. And Monak and Kriegel was indeed hidden in a cupboard for 18 months by a Ukrainian nationalist. So there are two kind of time scales in the book, really. One is, of course, the stories of these people, partisans in the forest, people in the ghettos, people who were in the camps, their stories. But the other is the sort of today, your the story of your encounters with survivors, with witnesses, as you drive around Europe from Poland to Italy to everywhere and go to Israel to talk to people. So you're very much in the, in the sort of center of the story of this book. Yes, um, I, I was in the center of it because again, I, I'm a journalist and I found this was the best way, was, it was a good way for me to tell the story. Um, I also know from other books that I've written in the past that people sometimes when you're talking about complicated things, they, it's nice if you've got somebody who can, who can actually guide you through it. Uh, um, I spent much of uh, the uh, the early well, all of the early 90s uh, living in Belgrade, watching the collapse of former Yugoslavia, as my husband reported on it. And I wrote a book about it because I had a very young family at the time, and it was my job to explain to them not to be rude to a man who was holding a Kalashnikov. Mm -hmm. And I wrote the book about this, and it, it was me explaining to my children why the world was collapsing around them, basically. And uh, and we were in Sarajevo and took the last plane out of Sarajevo, and. I, I know that people responded very positively to me when I wrote this book. So I actually argued to keep myself in the book. And I mean, it's up to you guys who've all read it to judge whether that was a good idea. But I think that without that, it would have been very dry and we wouldn't, we wouldn't have got across the fact that lots of people try to say that the Holocaust is history. It's not history. When you're sitting at somebody's kitchen table and you are chatting with them about it and their grandson is sitting next to you doing the translation. This is a story of second and third generation. And it's about how this impacts, it impacts through the generations, but how this is not, this is living history. These people have lived with it all their lives and went on to build very successful lives. I mean, actually interesting enough, the man I just mentioned, Menak and Kriegel, he went on to be a merchant seaman, never having seen the sea before he arrived uh, um, and sailed off on the Josiah Wedgwood. And Rosie, we should give the listeners and viewers a sort of flavour of some of these stories, because there are some quite extraordinary stories. And uh, for, ex for example, well, let me ask you, wh who, who are the most interesting people that you met in the course of all your research? Actually, they're the people I haven't yet met, because at the back of the book, I, we published the list of the names of the passengers. And I hope that this will be like an ongoing project and that somebody will be able to come and say, hey, that's me. Hey, that's my dad or that's my mom or that's my grandfather. And I can discover these other untold stories. I previously mentioned the Romanians. I mean, the Romanian story of the Holocaust of Transdenistria is another thing that's gone into the black hole. And these are really important things that we need to remember. And uh, so, yes, I, I can... We can talk about the colourful characters. I mentioned Menachem, um, and uh, that they're, they're bountiful and they come they come endlessly. But to me, the people who really intrigued me were the people that I couldn't find. And that although I did eventually find Yitzhak Kaplan, I spent days and days and days and days and days hunting for people who I found no trace of whatsoever. And that is, in itself, I think quite extraordinary, particularly when we look back at, at the Holocaust from 2020, we uh, rightly hold our Holocaust survivors, you know, as treasures, but that hasn't always been the case. And, uh, and that people, people, some people decided to talk about it, other people didn't. And uh, as I say in the book, when I actually end up in the gentleman's house where we're sitting um, and I show him the pictures of his friends on my computer, 
he then got up from the table and went over to his address book and said, well, I can give you the telephone numbers of all, all the other ones who were still arrived, but they don't talk. And then I said to him, well, what is this? Do you actually meet regularly and decide who's talking and who's not talking? To which he said, yes. And then he said, but they might talk to you. But I thought, well, it's not my role to harass people who decide they don't want to talk. But I'm not that kind of journalist. Um, but yes, I feel that all the stories are, are colorful and it's the ones I couldn't find. I end the book. Uh, after I'd been to interview uh, Moshe Ha'el on and I'm walking along the seafront in, in Tel Aviv and I just keep wondering whether I've actually just sat next to one of them on the old man on the bus was he one of the people I was looking for and I think it's these it's the fact that there are so many hidden stories and there is so much we don't know because it was a revelation to me what I discovered about these stories, largely the extent of Jewish resistance was an amazement to me. I had no idea of, of half of these resistance movements in these, in these smaller ghettos, and I had no idea of these stories. Well, let me ask you about one particular person, Salman Grinberg from Kaunas, because after, I, obviously I don't want to go through too many because I don't, we don't want to give away too much from, from the book, but just as a flavor of, of the power of some of these stories. Can you tell us a little bit about the story of Salman Grinberg? Yes, uh, Salman Grinberg was the doctor that I mentioned before at the Santa Tillian Monastery. And he, he had a, a small child uh, and, and a wife. And he smuggled his baby out of the Kovna ghetto. He was one of the people who smuggled children out in potato sacks. And he thought his child had died. He was separated from his wife on the train uh, after they evacuated. They destroyed the ghetto. The women were taken off at Stutthof and the men were taken, as I, I said, to the Kaufering camp at Landsberg. And uh, the extraordinary thing is that at the point of liberation, they are on a train, an open top train, being moved, they say, to uh, build the last defences for the Nazis who wanted to hold out in the, in the Alps. The train is bombed. Many of the people, many of the Holocaust survivors are killed and some of them are very badly wounded. But Grinberg, he has, he decides that he's going to save his people. And with the help of an American officer that he, he, he comes across at this point of liberation, he dresses up as a Red Cross official and goes to St. Ottilian Monastery, which is a host hospital for wounded German soldiers, and says he's requisitioned for the ILC. Uh, so this is, a, this is a man literally a day after liberation who's really, really knows what he's doing. And he set up this hospital in, in Santa Tillian Monastery. He also became the head of the Committee of the Liberated Jews of Bavaria. And he became a very important uh, figure for them. Uh, there's a very emotional story that I describe in the book where he organized a concert, a liberation concert, only weeks after that they, Dachau was liberated at the end of uh, April 1945. And in May, they held a liberation concert on the grass uh, outside the, uh, the hospital in St. Ottilian. And people sang and they played music. They played music which had been banned by the Nazis. And it was an incredibly moving moment, which ended with Grinberg making a rousing speech. And that gave the people tremendous self-confidence and agency and with the American rabbi who became his close friend Abraham Klausner the two of them set out to help to help the survivors who were not at this point being helped by the American forces and this was actually also a hunt for me because when I visited Santa Tillian Monastery and I spent the day talking to Father Cyril there who has been very keen to commemorate the story at the monastery and since I wrote my book he successfully managed to um, set up an information centre which was what he wanted to do and when I drove away before I drove away from the monastery he said I would love to find the families of uh, Salman Grinberg and Amos Klausner and I gaily said oh I, I'm, I'll try and do that and as I got in my car I'm thinking what the heck have I just said are you crazy woman well lo and behold I, I did track them down I discovered that Grinberg eventually um, went to went to America and I discovered in a reference in another book that his son became a doctor in Connecticut. Well, there was no stopping me then. I rang every single doctor called Grinberg in Connecticut until one day, you know, bingo, I found them. And it was the same with the, with the, the Klausner family. And in fact, it was wonderful because we were able to reunite everybody at St. Ottilian uh, two years ago for a reenactment of this concert. Uh, so in fact, um, 
in that sense, I had to stay in the story because I became part of the story in, in, in a funny way and, and moving it forward. And uh, so, yes, and now I'm very friendly with, uh, with the Grinberg family, which is uh, very funny. And may I ask you just one final question? What did you yourself learn about the Holocaust from all your research and from writing this book? That everybody thinks they know all about the Holocaust. You know, we have a Holocaust story in, in our family. My husband's grandmother was murdered in Auschwitz. You kind of think that if it's in your family, you should know everything about it uh, and that you should understand it. I mean, I, I studied history at university. I studied uh, I studied. Uh, postgraduate I studied history I've always been interested in uh, in Eastern Europe ever since I was a small child my father used to operate on patients my father was a doctor and he used to operate on patients who'd been operated by Dr Mengele so I grew up knowing what the Holocaust was knowing about these things and uh, and so I assumed that I, I knew I actually knew what I was talking about when I set off in my car I began to my amazement to discover that I didn't really understand what I was talking about. And as uh, the rabbi that I met in Rivna, he said, you know, the Holocaust is a thousand times worse than you actually realize what it is. I also learned that it's a thousand times more complicated than uh, the popular culture will, will accept. And I think herein lies the danger. It is so complicated and so complex that it becomes so extremely difficult sometimes to understand that there's a danger within it that you can say, no, this can pop, possibly have happened because it's beginning to get so complicated and so 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 out out of what we might even consider normal thinking of the holocaust it was a story when i discovered uh, that the partisans on my boat tried to murder six million germans uh, by poisoning their drinking water you begin to think like oh my god how more complicated does this story get and so that's what i learned that in fact i think that we think that we know about the holocaust but we don't and i think the danger is that we are too complacent. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Let me hand you back to Deborah, who will put forward the questions from all our listeners. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Rosie. Um, so we we're getting some claps there. That's nice. <laughs> um, so much information. So much information. It's incredible. So I've got a, I've got a few questions that I've written. First of all. You mentioned, um, obviously I know quite a few, if not most of the people here today, and you mentioned Transnistria and obviously Italy a lot. And I know that two members who I'm not going to name, but if they want to speak themselves, they may. Um, one was in Transnistria and the other um, was born and in, and in Italy during the war. So, um, and these are things that I didn't know about before I started. Um, working for AJR and 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 investigating our, our members' lives. So it's really, really fascinating. And um, the man who was hidden in the cupboard <laughs> by the Ukrainian nationalist, surely that's a book in itself. Um, yes, I think so. I mean, um, I've thought a lot about Menachem during the, the last uh, nine months, you know, you know, just if you're having a bad time in lockdown, just think about Menachem in his cupboard. And, yeah. and also my kids have thought a lot about him because he was locked in the cupboard with his mother. So spending a you know, uh, year and a half with your teenage son in a cupboard, I mean, just imagine how difficult that could possibly be. But also the, the story of Menachem, I think is, is really interesting because he, he and his mother were, were taken by the lady who looked after them immediately the soviet forces arrived she took them back to their flat in the in in Bukach. Uh, because they'd spent so long in a cupboard they couldn't walk so they had to crawl around because their legs had all swollen up and then eventually it, it, this is when you, i think you, we sometimes misunderstand that liberation is just like oh that's it chaps no the front line's going backwards and forwards backs and forwards like they tend to in wars and Bukach is going from Nazi hands back into Soviet hands backwards and forwards. And uh, at one point, he and his mother, who are now able to walk a bit, were out in the streets and a, a horse and cart went past and the horse and cart stopped to catch a horse of which, must, which belonged to a Nazi officer who must have been killed because a horse was charging. And at that point, she put Menachem on the back of the cart and he never saw her again. And so Menachem was left alone at the age of, uh, of, of 13 on the back of a cart and he had no one to look after him. Eventually a Jewish uh, doctor in the Red Army took him in and then 
incredibly, his sister, who had been in hiding, uh, appeared and found him. And she took them, she took him and his cousin to Krakow. Now, you kind of think we should be seeing a happy ending here, but of course we're not. That he and his cousin realized that she was only 19. She had she didn't have the wherewithal, the financial wherewithal to care for them. So they decided that they would join a group of children who were being taken to Vuj, to Lodz, uh, where lots of children were rounded in, lots of Holocaust survivors crammed into the town at the end of the war, and they were cared for in a children's home there. And they were then taken by the Jewish Brigade to Italy, where Menachem ended up in another children's home. And then I feel that one of the really moving bits which of this story is you feel like, oh, hooray, Menachem's sailing across the sea and he's going to be fine. When he arrived in, in, in Palestine, when he arrived in Haifa, the Jewish agency asked him what his name was. Now, he was originally called Emmanuel. And he had realized when he arrived in Italy that perhaps this wasn't such a great name after all, because obviously it was the name of the king and the king had been associated with fascism. So he thought, might be a good idea to change my name and he decided he wanted to name himself after his grandfather who was murdered in the holocaust and actually the jewish agency go no 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 you're menachem i find that one of the really disturbing things in in menachem's story but actually he's an incredible man because uh, he became a merchant seaman uh, and when i I, I've spent hours talking to him on the phone and then eventually when I met him a couple of times in his house in Haifa, he'd just come back from a lecture and he was busy go reading a book and, you know, it's such a, an, you know, such an interesting man and so full of life and so keen to entertain me and uh, you know, like many of them he kept insisting I should have a whiskey because I was a British person uh, and I'm like no it's actually only four o'clock in the afternoon, thank you very much, but uh, the, 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 um, how friendly and open people like Menachem were and keen to tell their story uh, was a great surprise to me. Mm, absolutely. Well, that is an incredible story. So very pleased I asked. Uh, right, we have a question from Susie Stone. Um, was there a relationship between the Jewish underground in Italy and the Jewish brigade? Yes, there was a very close relationship. Um, the Jewish Brigade, the British part of the Jewish Brigade up in Tarvisio, which is in the northeastern corner uh, of Italy, now hard up on the Slovene border, um, and right, it's the, it's the town before Austria. They mistakenly thought that they'd be out of the way there and out of harm's way, but of course the British had accidentally positioned them in the best place to actually rescue Holocaust survivors. When the British command realised this, they took the actual Jewish brigade out and they moved them uh, to Brussels but and then eventually they were they were sent back to Palestine but many of those people who went back to Palestine were not Jewish brigade soldiers they were survivors who looked a lot like them who they gave their uniforms and their papers to and the leader of the underground movement in Italy Yehuda Arazi who came from Jerusalem he was a really audacious character and he set up his own British Army Phantom Brigade and he took the trucks and all of the things which had belonged to the Jewish Brigade when they were in Italy and he created a, a, literally a pretend brigade which went around different British bases collecting supplies, collecting petrol, collecting food, which was all used to ferry the, the Holocaust survivors to the ports and could care for them in Italy. And, uh, and uh, so, yes, there is this very intricate role. And many of the soldiers who had been in the Jewish Brigade made their way back to Italy and were key players in, in the underground movement. So, yes, it's a, there's a very close connection. Um your knowledge of everything is just overwhelming. How much, how much did you, did you know any of this before you started working on the book? Um, I knew certain elements. Obviously, as I said, I've been a lot in, uh, in Western Ukraine um, and uh, spent a, a lot of time. When I was a child, uh, uh, my father's best friend was, Jew, was Jewish from Lvov and he, was, he would always talk to me about his childhood and his life. So, Yes, I, about certain areas uh, I knew a lot, but uh, about other areas, no. And, you know, 
I mean, I, I spent most of my life traveling around in, in Eastern Europe, uh, um, but even that doesn't mean you know something. I mean, I, I lived for 18 months in, in Bucharest just after the revolution, but I still don't know very much about Transnistria. Um, all I know is that we don't know enough about it. Um, so yes, it was a revelation to me. I had to read hundreds and hundreds of books and talk to hundreds and hundreds of people and drive hundreds and hundreds of miles to discover all of this of what was actually going on. And, uh, you know, it, and, I couldn't have done it again without modern technology because you know, I was able to read books in languages I don't speak using Google Translate. I mean, I'm lucky and my Italian is good enough to get by in Italy, but you know, I don't speak Polish, I, don't, I certainly don't speak Lithuanian. And it's just like, and I was able to, uh, to, 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 to read, read notices in museums. And, and I think it just, I was quite audacious, I suppose being a journalist like that, you just go up and you talk to people and see what they've got to tell you. Absolutely. So you you say you relied on. Uh, I mean, you used a lot of modern technology, but but then you're you're talking about getting in your car and driving around. Um, how many miles did you do? Um, well, basically, uh, well, I, I I was in Kiev when I went to Rivna, and I took the train to Rivna, and that was very interesting because I retraced in February the steps of the Red Army. And of course, the train goes through Berdichev, which is, uh, you know, some of these iconic places in, in, in Ukraine. But I then drove from, from Italy all the way up to, up to Kovna and then back down again. So I have no idea, it was a long way. <laughs> and, uh, and on all over Bavaria and, uh, and then all over, uh, you know, all over Italy, because uh, the, the story in Italy was, was fascinating. And I've written a lot about it in newspapers because it's, it's quite polit political and contemporary. Mm. Absolutely. Right. We've got a, well, uh, not, not so much a question, but, but uh, a thank you from Charlotte. Thank you, Rosie, for writing this utterly amazing book. Thank I feel you. overwhelmed. As, as indeed do I, uh, with the information. Whoever dares deny the Holocaust should read it or even speak to you. <laughs> well, I hope so. I mean, I'm, I'm very involved in Holocaust education here. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I, uh, I'm the uh, historical advisor for the 45 Aid Society as well yes. as St. Tropa. And uh, I work very closely with them in bringing out Holocaust education programs here in the UK. And uh, and I speak in classrooms myself. And yeah. I think it is very important to, uh, to, to keep on getting this message out. And it's really hard now. I have my own little uh, uh, Holocaust education project in Ascot, the Ascot Holocaust education project. And it's it's been very difficult to interest schools in, in, in doing anything at the moment because they're under so much pressure. And, you know, it's it, unfortunately Holocaust education is one of those things that's being pushed push to the side. And that's something that I'm hoping that we're, we're going to be able to address in the next six months. Wonderful, yeah. Um, so Charlotte also asks if a, if a television documentary is, uh is a possibility? Um, well, I am discussing this with somebody and not a documentary. Uh, I think that this, this lends itself to a drama. So uh, watch this space. Wonderful. Um, Leila Silfkin, Slifkin, sorry, has asked, are places like Atlet Camp going to include, uh, be included in your new research? Um, Atlet is in the book, and, and I did visit Atlet um, when uh, when I was writing the book, and it is a very eerie place. When you you pull into the station, the the wooden watchtowers are, are still there. I mean, you know, there's it's like a ghostly memory uh, of uh, of the Palestine mandate, really. And uh, yes, I mean, Atlet is Atlet is was a little bit tricky um, for me. They actually said that the information that they had about the people on the boat was actually private and they wouldn't share it with me uh, but they would give me the names they gave me the names of the people that they had testimonies from and it was because of this that actually I was able to track down another person on the boat because he came from Radon and I, I'd been to Radon I was interested in Radon and, um, as uh, to what happened there and um, I couldn't understand this person's name he had a completely different name um, but when I went and I read his testimonies and I listened to his, his testimony I began to realize that in fact because he talked about his parents and he gave their surnames that he was another person who I had been unable to identify so it's so important 
uh, to list the parents' names, which is why when you look at the list at the back of the book that I've done that, because if these are people who change their names, it's the parents who were the key to working out who these people are. And he went on to become a professor, of, uh, a professor at university. And you think, how did people do this when they, they had no education? Uh, you know, they, they had been they not only, you know, been in appalling situations, they, they'd actually been deprived of education. And you see that in so many stories of the young child Holocaust survivors that they were thirsty for knowledge. And I think that that's a really important message to get across to kids today is if you, you can't have it, that's when you want it. You know, you think how many times you've grown about going to school. Well, when you, when you don't have it anymore, you miss it. Absolutely. Right, well, we don't have any more questions. Any any further questions want to? Ah, oh, here we go. Sandra Walker, thank you for this fascinating book. I lived, I lived in Italy for 13 years near La Spezia, I can't speak, Liguria, and often heard vague stories of treks over the Apennines? Apennines, yes. Apennines, thank you, sorry not good on mountain ranges uh, but only vague stories i'm wondering if any of the any of the joined the boat any of them joined the boat of which you speak okay. actually yes there's a whole chapter devoted to uh, la spezia in my book because la spezia was the scene of uh, where a boat was impounded first by the Italian police because they thought it was it was fascist trying to escape. And when the British Navy got wind of this, the British Navy blocked this boat from leaving. And this is a very dramatic story in which the survivors went on a hunger strike and threatened to kill themselves. It's called the La Spezia Affair. And we might recognize parts of this story because it inspired Leon Uris and it appears in Exodus in a fictionalized version. Um, but the La Spezia affair was a major event. And um, in the book, I write about it, but I also write about the fact that the pier where this boat was impounded, where the people, the people suffered so terribly on this hunger strike, was uh, being knocked down by the local port authority. And when I went to La Spezia, I went to the mayor and asked the mayor why this was the case. He disappeared into his back room. And then after a few telephone calls came out and said, oh, this afternoon, we will announce a memorial will be built on the pier. So I felt I did my little bit for remembering there. But it is a very important story. And uh, it is now being remembered in, in La Spezia, which I think is, is very important. And so if you read the book, you can read all about what happened in La Spezia, which, of course, was, was is still an important Italian naval port. Lovely. So let's let's end there with that important uh, message that you just get, gave. Uh, read the book. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe your publisher is offering uh, a discount, um, I think. That's right. If you if you go to the Hearst website and you type in people in capital letters, 25, you get a 25 percent discount. Right. Wonderful. A better deal than if you go on Amazon. Okay, that's and uh, you can follow me. I'm on Twitter. I'm at Rosie Whitehouse on Twitter, and you can you can follow me and many of the other stories that that, that I write about. Mm, lovely. Okay, great. Well, that's that's been wonderful. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you, David. Um, so I hope everybody found that really interesting. I'm sure they did. And please do get the book and read it. And thank you very much, Rosie. And we will see you all soon for our next event. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye.